Hello there, Cert4 Belmont, back again, another little video. We're looking at that networking subject that Jim's been starting you off with. So thanks to Jim, and hopefully that's going okay. So the official name is Develop and Maintain Networks and Collaborative Partnerships. And we're looking at the knowledge question, starting with some multiple choice questions collaboration being working in partnerships with others and networks the idea of working with other I guess mutually beneficial and supportive relationships with other services uh, typically I guess we're looking in the community services broadly speaking but I guess it can go beyond that and networks can certainly go across that you know it could be media uh, other entrepreneurial groups um, business politics etc etc so question one you could best describe the principles of networking collaboration as, and there's more than one answer. So they're actually select one, two, three, five. But I'll just go through this little blackboard, whiteboard. So the principles of networking relating to question one, all people are valued members of the community and have something to contribute. I guess coming from that perspective to start with, it's not about being a an exclusive group. I guess we're coming from that strength perspective who want their people to contribute and feel that they can contribute. But there's clarity and realism in the roles that people are doing within the network. And people are clear what it's all about, why they're doing it. And they feel people uh, or the members feel connected and committed. And there's a sense of ownership in that network. I guess we're looking at, say, the Homeless Connect Network is one that comes to mind. Services across the, the region in the Hunter, there's a Central Coast one, but in the region in the, of the Hunter, people are working together to make, I guess, better opportunities for people who are at risk or experiencing homelessness. And in that network, there are certainly people who are in the contributing and the organising who are in that vulnerable group as well. And so that next point, trust is developed and maintained, and I guess that's partly about that open communication, the acceptance of people for who they are, and getting runs on the board, I guess, doing little achievements along the way. And there's clear and ro robust partnerships, and, and I guess part of that is discussing ideas and opinions. I guess not to say that everyone's idea and opinion will be actually acted upon, but having that robust discussion and being clear about the decisions that are made. Uh, and the last point there, there is recognition and acceptance that working in partnerships help solve problems plan the best approaches and practices. Uh, identify three examples of formal networks and collaboration. That's question two. So we're looking at formal networks. And I can tell you that they've picked three answers there. What they've gone with is that interagency meetings. They've gone with the interagency meetings. The way that I'm looking at that is that there might be particular groups in a, in a community, I guess, that focus on perhaps employment services, uh, that perhaps uh, services that focus on people with a disability, or likewise there are homelessness services, working with people at risk of homelessness or at homelessness, there are youth services, age services, just to, to give us a basic snapshot there. And within those, there can be interagency. So I guess my, I guess, experience primarily could be amongst the homelessness services coming together and having uh, meetings and what called interagency meetings to discuss what's going on, best practice issues, um, strategies, things like that. Likewise, in the youth sector, similar sort of thing. Representations from across our region, whether it's Lake Macquarie, Newcastle, or, or combined, or in some one of my experiences within the upper, upper hunter, but there were still interagency meetings again in those uh, services. The other one that they look at is stakeholder engagement meetings. So I guess explaining stakeholders, it could be you know people who are carers coming together in some sort of support group or network so they're a stakeholder there could be people in that mental health space as stakeholders um, some of the readings i've read they mentioned the RAFNI, so the associations of relatives and friends of people who are uh, mentally unwell uh, the acronym RAFNI. Um, there's a stakeholder coming together for support, similarly AOD, I suppose, Alcoholics Anonymous as a network coming together for support in that disability space. An example I saw with writing for the disabled RDA as a network of stakeholders that come together uh, and network and collaborate and plan. So that stakeholder engagement meeting was the other one. Then the other, other one that's identified is E, professional and occupational association. So places or sorry, a professional association like the Social Workers Association of Australia. 
uh, yeah, I guess I say a collective or a group that come together and support people who are registered social workers. Similarly, Youth Workers Association uh, in New South Wales. Youth Action is one that comes to mind for youth workers supporting and uh, there are, I guess, professional stakeholders or group that support that that body. And then there's another example I've got here is the Australian and New Zealand Mental Health Association. So I guess support in that professional work is in that mental health space. So that was the formal networks. Started off with the idea of interagency. Um, yeah, and I guess I, I sort of elaborated or, or indicated that there was that idea that all organisational networks, you know, come from spheres like aged care or health or First Nations, disability, income and employment, accommodation, advocacy, multicultural or youth. Just a snapshot, you know, all those different focus areas in community services might have um, networks that collaborate, interagency type approach, and that's, you know, not the they're not the only categories, they said it's more, and it's a bit fluid, and some, you know, sometimes they, groups come across and work across those those groups for sure. I've got a little uh, slide too there, the virtual networks, the communication methods, so social media, industry forums, blogs, online meeting services, and video calls, so I think that's going to come uh, useful shortly. Question three, so we're looking at the informal networks. So that informal one was a little bit interesting. I found the information or the perspective that they're coming from and they're saying, yeah, links and relationships you make in the course of your work, but they're not formal agreements based on sharing info and mutual support. So they're saying they may not have a direct connection to the work that we do in the example. So they've gone with A. Uh, but B I found interesting as professional discussions that occur outside of work hours, which is the provided answer. So it's A and B. You know, I would certainly have professional discuss professional discussions across workers from other organisations. I would, you know, in a sense, in formal networks, but would be inside working hours. I find that uh, a little bit hard to interpret that it's outside of work hours. That's why I'm, I guess I'm being quite quite explicit about some of the answers here because it can be a little confusing to say the least. Mentors, if you like, across various sectors over the years and yeah happy to get on the phone or give an email and just have a little bit of a chat and see what's happening or maybe get advice open up opportunities for other jobs um, funding government funding that sort of sort of options but anyways a and b okay question four two benefits of networking and collaborating for an individual uh, I think I just alluded to that actually. So professional development opportunities is B. So yeah, training new opportunities. So networking and collaboration. So if you get you're collaborating across a wide range or a wide network, you you're finding out more stuff uh, and getting expert advice. Question five: uh, Effective organisational networking and collaboration includes, and that's more than one example. Now this was one. But I did find a little bit odd. So effective organisational networking collaborating includes, and there's more than one answer, so video conferencing, team building days, interactive displays and social media. So well, I guess I'll break down this question. So what they've gone with organisational networking. So within your organisation. So having a video conference and team building days are the provided answers. Interactive displays, not so much about networking within the organisation or so social media within the organisation. I, I mean, I certainly could have went with social media. And I've got nothing against a good interactive display there, but anyway, I guess within an organisation, networking, collaboration, so certainly team building days are you know, really good and I love them and we don't get them as much as we used to, which is unfortunate uh, in, in this particular environment that I'm working in, but I've done some great team building day, great team building days over the years and it is about getting to know your colleagues and sharing ideas and finding out strengths and passions and all those sort of things. And I guess more modern times, I'm dwelling in the past there with my team building days to a degree, but the video conference certainly in, in the COVID times is how we exchange a lot of our info, whether it's Teams or Skype or, or something like that. It's maybe they see social media as putting out information about a service and trying, you know, promote an event or, or get knowledge out there, raise awareness. 
uh, maybe it's not seen as a internal networking tool. Anyway, spend enough time on that one. Number six, identify three network and collaborative techniques that occur virtually. So they're very specific, specific here about virtual networking. And I did sp spoke a little bit about that earlier. The video conferencing, they're considering that yeah, certainly a virtual tool to network. Not the team building days in this context, so that's not a virtual thing. Maybe it will be in the future, some sort of team building that's virtually and interactive. I wouldn't be surprised if it possibly exists already. The prescribed answer was the video conferencing, the interactive displays they've gone with here as a, as a virtual, and social media as a virtual collaboration technique. So drawing what's the difference between the uh, effective organisational networking and the virtual networking, I suppose. Anyway, they've drawn the line there. Video conferencing, interactive displays and social media is the virtual approaches. Okay, as also aforementioned, I mentioned things like forums, blogs, seminars, meetings, so they can all happen virtually. So we're looking at seven, which is the legal and ethical considerations regarding copyright and intellectual property. The copyright is that legal protection of all things that you or an organisation create, so things that you might produce, written stuff, could be music, could be audio visual, uh, pamphlets, flyers, posters, and the intellectual property going along with that, so that innovation and product development sort of, sort of uh, side of things, so that creative, and I guess when we say creative approaches, it might be a particular concept of, of a particular online event, perhaps. Uh, yeah, basically the, a big point there is that permission to share, whether it's copyrighted material, obviously, or intellectual property. But yeah, certainly the benefit of sharing resources to achieve better outcomes is something that networks would certainly discuss and be upfront about, and some organisation might be have some leader or be cut, cutting edge in some of this sort of uh, material, whether it could be training resources, even logos, knowledge expertise, perhaps in certain areas. But the upshot of it is it needs to be considered and worked into the agreement. So, but they're looking at uh, B and C there. But number eight, we're looking at that privacy, confidentiality, disclosure is important during collaborative practice and you've got to select three answers. We've, we've spoken a lot in this course about privacy, confidentiality and disclosure and the importance of and I think we're well versed with that. I guess the only thing that's slightly different here if you're collaborating across different services, whatever that might be, and you, a collaboration across services might be working with one client perhaps, really case managing and, and coming up with a, a really good approach for someone with perhaps with some complex needs, doesn't mean you ignore those privacy and confidentiality uh, principles and laws and likewise you could be working uh, in that more of a community space across organisations and you might have clients and volunteers working and it's still important. Upheld people's privacy and confidentiality at all times and needing appropriate permission to release information and if you're releasing info only that relevant information and the organisational policies and procedures really guide what's what uh, is going to be happening and it, you know even if you're working collaboratively across different organizations your organization will certainly have their policies and procedures perhaps the network that you're working in has their own uh, policies and procedures it's more likely that you're following your, still your own guidelines for your own organization and things like um, maintaining that privacy storage of information still gets uh, upheld so this table one or number one in part two tracked select true or false for each statement below about public and a private. So public organisations we're going to interpret as government organisations. Public equals government. So I guess in a sense taxpayer, taxpayer funded in some way, shape or form. Public organisations, I guess it could be local government, state government, federal government funded or directly as a representative of the, of the government. Uh, like, Family and Community Services as a government organisation, Corrective Services as a government organisation in most cases. And then the distinction there between the private services, uh, a non-government service. So I'll just go through them, identify whether they're a government or non-government service, I guess. Judicial and legal services are public organisations or government organisations. Yes, they are. So courts are upholders of law and order, they're government 
organisations, government institutions. Advocacy services are private organisations. I don't know if we've gone too much into advocacy services per se, but Advocacy New South Wales comes to mind as a, the advocate for people with a disability, and they're not private organisations, they are government funded and uh, you know government administered if you like. So advocacy services are the ones that I'm aware of are government organisations, so they're not private. Leisure and recreation providers are private organisations. So in, I guess in most instances, leisure and recreation providers often are private companies, private businesses out there providing services to have, so that people have a good time. Maybe it's abseiling, maybe it's doing high speed uh, boating, watching whales. So they're providers, they're, they're leisure providers if you like, recreation and they're private organisations. They're not government organisations. So next one, consumer groups are private organisations. So yes, they're not government, they're yeah, consumer groups are not a government organisation, they're a private organisation. Uh, financial institutions are public organisations, financial institutions, banks in particular. So they're not arms of government, they're actually basically a, a business. So they'd be a private organisation. A lot of those big financial institutions, they're about making money. I guess we know that because of the fees and charges. This one is interesting. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services are public organisations. I guess that's a sweet, uh, broad, sweet sweeping sort of group there, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander services are public organisations. So if we think about some of the big ones, uh, land councils, health services that are Aboriginal focused like Awabikal, yes they are public or government funded organisations. So I'm not sure there are Aboriginal and Torres Strait services that are private organisations. However, we're going here that public. Okay, so I didn't write the question, so I'm just interpreting. All right, select true uh, or false. So this is number two, select true or false for each statement below about the relationship between public and private organizations. So, so allow for current and reliable exchange of info. Well, we certainly hope so. I'd like that to be true. So if there's a, a, a way of exchanging info between the public and the private sector, yeah, that's, that's what we want. Uh, and likewise, referrals between public and private organisations needs to be true. A lot of disability services are a bit set up as private companies too. And then they're, I guess they're liaising between NDIS and other arms of government. So those referrals between both private and, and public. Uh, partnerships and networks are always active. Well, that's not always the case. Sometimes networks do, do go through quiet times where they're not doing anything. They, for whatever reason, they may shut, shut their books and not be active. So they're not always active. Collaboration is of equal benefit to each organisation. So this is between the public and the private organisations. Well, we'd like all collaboration to have benefit to everybody, but I guess it's not always going to be of equal benefit. So it's not always equal benefit to each organisation. Should it always benefit the client, the last one? Well, yeah, it should always benefit the client. So we'll go with true on that one. I'm gonna leave it there. I'll, be able to, I'll work through the rest because they do take a little bit of interpreting some of those questions. So I'll do that in class. Toodle pips.